Whether thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no hollow, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink. Thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own. Into our house enter thou not. Through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps and Peepers. Hope Welcome. you're ready for some horror. I'm ready. I'm Dan. Hi, I'm Lindsay. I'm hello, just protecting hello. Protecting myself. Uh, YouTube viewers, be sure and check out the screen right now for this week's 20% off merch discount code. Very cool, Scared to Death, Rest in Beach. Oh, tees yeah. and tank tops. They are super fun. In the badmagicmerch.com store. Uh, well done, Logan Keith on Rest and Beach. <laughs> the skeletal designs fit that perfectly. It is. It's great. And, th- and that's it. And we're going to get right into our show. That's it. Let's do it, Dan. Uh, we have a Poltergeist summer double feature today. Oh, okay. Mm, very A very traditional episode, I think, in like really cool ways. Okay. So today uh, uh, we have two stories of physical dwellings mm-hmm. seemingly afflicted by large amounts of heavily witnessed paranormal activity. Okay. The first takes place in Canada. Uh, in the in the uh, early seventies, and oh. the second one of my stories is in Canada today oh, really? too. Yeah, and the second takes place uh, out in uh, Long Island. Okay, in the fifties. Uh, okay, okay. Well, I'm glad I wore my summer dress. It has pockets. I like I like your summer dress very much. <laughs> we need to talk cute. about it. Never looks good when I'm sitting down, but it's great. I love it. I love it. And well, because you're happy that I'm not just wearing black again. <laughs> <laughs> and and the first story uh, also a uh, uh, not a listener tale, but comes from a listener. What does that mean? Uh, a listener pointed me towards this first oh, uh, like uh, a poltergeist listener. story. Uh-huh. One of one of our creeps and peepers pointed me. Thomas Hode pointed okay, me Thomas. towards the story. So it was mm-hmm. a suggestion. Mm-hmm. Like a, a, a suggestion. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. His great his grandfather told me about this story. He uh, passed it along to me. I looked into it and was like, Oh yeah, we got to do this one. Okay. Yeah, I'm amazed when when uh, we come across these stories. Then I'm like, how is this not much much more well known? Oh, okay. I can't show my socks off today because I'm wearing a dress. So. Okay. It's not a okay. free show for everyone. <laughs> uh, okay. So quite a bit of setup on this first story. Okay. As you okay. get ready. Okay. I'm, I'm ready. Let's do it. Uh, 9 p.m. on Friday, February 6, 1970, officers Bob Crawford and Bill Weir of the Niagara Regional Police Force responded to a domestic dispute call at 237 Church Street, apartment number one in St. Catharines, Ontario. St. Catharines is Canada's so-called garden city has a metro area population of about 400,000, less than 15 miles from Niagara Falls. Big enough city to have a police force full of officers who'd encountered all manner of crimes, from gruesome murders to troubling disappearances. But the numerous officers involved in the story would all later claim to have never seen anything like what they'd witnessed or what they would witness on Church Street in February of 1970. They all saw things they simply couldn't explain, things that scared them to their cores, things they discussed with their sergeant, Sergeant Taylor, one of numerous officers to file a police report about paranormal activity. By the time the first report was filed, a total of six officers would claim to witness paranormal events. By the time the paranormal activity would end, the family's lawyer, additional officers, two doctors, a local priest, and an untold number of friends, family, and neighbors also all claim to witness unexplainable phenomena. Holy hell. Heavily witnessed. Uh, Here is some of what Sergeant Taylor wrote in one of the first official police reports regarding what became known as the Church Street Poltergeist filed on February 10th, 1970. So this is from the police report. While I was there, I witnessed some phenomenal occurrences which I have attached to this report. After witnessing unusual things taking place, I contacted Mr. Bradley, the building inspector, We both agree that the causes of these weird occurrences were in no way connected to the actual building structure itself. My only solution to these occurrences is that the boy Peter, whom all these occurrences surround, has been inhabited by a spirit of a poltergeist. The boy can't sit on a chair without being thrown off, and items are hitting him for no apparent reason. I, the writer, witnessed the boy being thrown on at least a dozen occasions, including while I was there with Officer Crawford. Officer Crawford would later recall when interviewed years later in 1995 by a paranormal investigator that he had been the first officer to respond to 237 Church Street, apartment number one. So time now for the tale of the Church Street poltergeist. A woman later identified as Barbara Page was the first to call police that February. 
When Officer Crawford arrived at the building on Church Street, Barbara was waiting for him downstairs, and she asked him to come upstairs with her so he could see with his own eyes what would only make her sound crazy to try and explain to him. Crawford followed her into her apartment, which he described as being in total disarray. Inside was her husband, John Page, and their 11-year-old son, Peter, and Peter's 8-year-old brother, not identified by name in police reports or any other sources I could find. Barbara told Crawford that she and her family had been witnessing objects and furniture being moved through the air by unseen forces for about 10 days. They'd only just barely moved into their apartment when everything started to happen. Crawford was shown a chest of drawers laying on its side in the kitchen. Barbara said it all began with a series of scratchy noises and knocking heard coming from inside the walls. Soon after hearing these sounds, furniture started to move around on its own. Doors began to open and close without anyone touching them. Even more disturbing, plastered walls would undulate and bend and warp. What? And then return to form like something inside was trying to get out, something that was in some way alive. Their son Peter seemed to be the focal point of all this activity. It only occurred when he was home and much of the activity involved him directly. He'd often be thrown out of chairs, floating objects would move around him, sometimes encircling him, sometimes hitting him. Most of the activity happened in his bedroom. After listening to Barbara and John describe all these strange, hard to fathom events, Officer Crawford advised them to contact a member of the clergy, but they'd already done that. In fact, while interviewing the pages, a priest from a local Roman Catholic church arrived at the Church Street apartment. The priest told Officer Crawford he'd been to the residence previously and had witnessed paranormal incidents like a bed moving away from a wall. The priest explained that he pushed the bed back to the wall, and then when he turned his head, no one else was in the room. The bed moved away from the wall again, seemingly dragged or pushed by unseen forces. Oh my God, get the fuck out of there. As the priest relayed this story, John and Barbara corroborated witnessing the unnatural movement of the bed as well. The pages were clearly terrified by all this, and they started to get emotionally worked up as Crawford listened to them share more and more incidents as he stood in the kitchen with them and tried to take it all in. Barbara began to work herself up, approaching the point of hysteria. Crawford requested that everyone try to remain calm and instructed the pages and their priest to go into the living room. Crawford was the last person to leave the kitchen, and as he left, he moved a chair out of his way and placed the chair against the kitchen table before entering the living room. Then, while trying to calm down Barbara, while everyone in the living room was sitting down, both Crawford and the priest heard the distinct sound of footsteps moving across the living room and into the kitchen. The pages assured him that no one else was in the apartment. Crawford and the priest stood up and slowly walked back into the kitchen. The hair on the back of his neck stood on end. He felt fear in the pit of his stomach. What the hell was going on in this godforsaken apartment? The sounds of the footsteps seemed to now bolt out of the kitchen. Crawford popped into the kitchen, wide-eyed with his gun drawn. Whoever or whatever was once in the kitchen was now no longer there. And he now noticed that the chair he himself had moved against the kitchen table was now in the middle of the kitchen floor, several feet from where he had just left it. Forget it. I'm out. The priest then told Crawford that this was exactly the type of occurrence that had been happening over and over again for the past 10 days. This is terrifying. As Crawford discussed previous occurrences with the priest, another officer arrived, Constable Bill Weir. Weir thought it was uh, he was just backing up Crawford on a routine domestic call. And here's where this already disturbing story gets more disturbing. After being brought up to speed regarding everything he'd either uh, been told or had witnessed with his own eyes by Crawford, uh, Weir then scared everyone further by describing how he himself had responded to other claims of disturbances in this exact same building just a month prior. Oh, dang. Weir said that he'd been called to Church Street on January 15th, 1970, and he was made aware of odd occurrences which had been reported by the tenants of a different apartment. There had been reports of loud noises coming from inside the walls, objects moving on their own, and other strange experiences. Since that first visit, Weir claimed to have contacted the engineering department of St. Catharines, who inspected the building, found no structural damage. The gas company also called... Uh, the entire heating and water system was inspected. Everything was working fine. Everything in good condition, well within normal operating specifications. And now on February 6th, Weir would later claim to witness firsthand the events other tenants had told him about back on January 15th. 
Weir and Crawford both stated that they now witnessed several bowling trophies being tossed off a shelf one after another onto the floor. Weir also reported that he observed the kitchen wall clock unplug itself, then be thrown from the wall by an unseen force, violently crashing into the floor. Impossibly, it hit the floor without making any sound. <sighs> like Crawford, Weir also later spoke to the majority of the occurrences he witnessed being centered around 11-year-old Peter. He stated that when Peter walked through the apartment, pictures on the wall, quote, swayed in the same manner as a dog wags its tail when it's happy to see its master. Crawford, Weir, and then numerous other officers would visit the apartment of the, over the next several days and all stated that they witnessed an invisible force push Peter against the wall on several occasions. And they also claimed that as the 11-year-old was sitting in a large and heavy chair, the chair flipped over on its own in front of the officers, pinning Peter to the floor. The chair was so heavy it took two officers to lift the chair off of him, far too heavy for Peter to somehow have moved it on his own in the way that officers witnessed. What the hell? The police also stated that on one occasion, they witnessed a heavier Chesterfield sofa holding four people levitate 18 inches off the floor, remain in the air for roughly 10 seconds. No way! One of the ladies who was sitting on the Chesterfield fainted when she realized that she was sitting on a levitating piece of furniture. Weir also claimed something even more unusual, that Peter was sitting on the knee of a police officer when an unseen entity tried to remove him, something grabbed him, and it took the strength of two officers to keep him on the knee where he sat. Day after day, more and more evidence of something at work that was that has clearly not been explained by science continued to manifest itself in front of numerous witnesses. Everybody get the fuck out. Everybody. Officers witnessed Peter's bed levitating up from the bedroom floor. They watched the frightened boy jump off. Only then did the bed slowly return to the floor. Officers watched Peter run from the room. When they turned back around, the bed was suddenly about two feet off the ground, being supported by two chairs that were across the room from the bed just a moment earlier. Oh, God. Officers watched dolls and pictures fall from the walls. A large, heavy chest of drawers move away from one wall, then slam back into it. They witnessed a chair in the opposite corner of Peter's room rise into the air, then slam down and break into pieces against the floor. In the corners of their eyes, they began to see strange and disturbing and menacing shadows moving about behind them. Oh, God. The only two items in the apartment that never seemed to move on their own were a crucifix and a picture of the Virgin Mary with a palm leaf over the frame. Weird. How disturbing for so many witnesses to report these details. According to another police report on February 11th, 1970, several officers and detectives, including a police photographer with a 35 millimeter camera, movie camera and tape recorder entered the seemingly haunted apartment. Along with them were two doctors, a lawyer, family members, and several members of the clergy. And even though police reports were marked with this item not for press and repeat not for press, the press found out what they were doing here. The immediate area of 237 Church Street turned into a media circus. Suddenly, family members could not leave their apartment building without reporters badgering them. A reporter for the National Enquirer even tried disguising herself as a nun, hoping to get access to the family's apartment. That's hilarious. <laughs> and witnessed the activity firsthand. The family's lawyer made it clear that the pages had no interest in speaking with the media, and they didn't. The pages never gave any interviews about this. Wow. Th this was not about attention or fame or money. It was about terror and terror alone. To this day, surviving family members like Peter will not talk about it. When the media harassment began, the police requested that John make arrangements for Peter and his little brother to spend the night elsewhere. When the kids started getting dressed to leave the apartment, a huge heavy bookcase fell over, crashing to the floor, almost smashing them. Oh my God. Luckily, they were not injured. Then according to officers Weir, Crawford, and another officer, McMenonen, when Peter left and, and stayed with his grandma, the poltergeist activity at the apartment completely stopped. And when he came back, it returned. Oh, buddy. Then in late February, it went away again. According to officers Bill, uh, Officer Bill Weir, the poltergeist activity at 237 Church Street, apartment number one, lasted exactly 28 days, one complete lunar cycle, and then completely stopped. A short time later, the Page family moved out. They would report no further, further disturbances at any future addresses. And whoever moved into their Church Street apartment never reported any more disturbances either. What? Where did whatever was terrorizing them go? Nobody knows. The location is now a Pete's Pizzeria. <laughs> and there is no rumors of further paranormal activity. So just 28 days of terror inexplicably began, inexplicably ended. But the weir 
the in neighbor. January. The day, yes. So there was, uh, there was, and I'm not sure if that, you know, it wasn't made clear in the reports I read if that was part of the cycle right. or not. It may have been. It, it may have been. and to, with to, a, to get that full 28 days. And with it being a neighbor, it could very well have been that they were hearing what was happening in the Page's apartment and wasn't necessarily happening in Correct. Al- Correct. also in another apartment. Correct. Yeah, that part was also not made clear. But but the specific like uh, yeah, the yeah, uh, the, yeah, pa- yeah. the, the gonna... page apartment. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So here's some pictures. Yeah, I am freaked out. It's just so. I mean, it, it, numerous police reports. Actually, the first picture is a police report. This is the first police report that was released. <laughs> Repeat, not for press. Right. Right. Wow. Uh, this is the building today. This next picture. I mean it. <laughs> It couldn't seem more harmless today. It is just a Pete's pizzeria, a Pete's pizza. <laughs> Pete's pizza. <laughs> I'm hungry. I looked. I know. I looked at some reviews. It's, it seems like it's good pizza. Um, and do then they have, do they have a white sauce. I, I, didn't, I didn't see if they had a white sauce. I don't care for red sauce. <laughs> and then uh, one more picture related to the story. Uh, uh-huh. If we can get a little closer look at this guy mm-hmm. now. <laughs> A clown at a desk. For those of you listening, uh, this is not, and really not watching. It's a stupid, stupid photo. I ended up googling different things, and I just, I just love this because I googled "scary Canadian." <laughs> 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 this is what came up. <laughs> just a weird dude, a clown what? costume at his desk. He I looks love him so really much. mad. He does have very scary eyes. <laughs> <laughs> you stare a little too hard. So I like the little friends. snapple but, on his desk. But okay. what a what a crazy crazy story. And, and I just can't believe like uh, you know because I will scour in some moment just looking for future stories, all kinds of different Google searches, looking for hauntings, right. shadow people, like all different kinds of stories. And it, and it gets really tricky once you've done the first twenty or thirty to find new right. ones. Right, because like, the same ones keep coming up. The same one, that, like you know, like when people put together like around Halloween like uh, lists of like the ten scariest true yeah, stories. Yeah. It's almost always the same stories. And then something like this will come up. And I'm like, this this story is way scarier to me uh-huh. than almost all of the stories that make the top 10 lists. Right. Because it's so well documented. Like, yeah, numerous. I mean. Doctors, lawyers, mm-hmm. priests, police right. officers. It's like all the people yeah. that you trust. Right. And I did and I did watch, you know, that it wasn't part of the story I told, but I watched YouTube interviews of some of the officers, you know, that are now retired. Yeah. And and they haven't retracted any piece of it. And and, and they have a sense of humor about it. Right. They're laughing. They're like, I know I sound like an it's this tone of like, I know I sound like a nut. In a tone of like, if if I was watching me, I would think crazy. <laughs> but but you Fair. know, but they all are like, Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how to explain it. It still haunts me all these years later. You know, that they just they don't understand what they witnessed. I wonder why the pages don't want to give an interview. I don't know, but that makes it scarier to me and more credible because sometimes, not that not that it is, but sometimes, you know, some people's reports do come across as an attention grab. Sure, of course. Of like, you know, and there's got and, and some of them I'm sure are this element of like, look at me, look at how unique I am, right? And whatever. Or like they take this none one, of that with this. Well, right, and sometimes they take one small thing. I mean, mm-hmm. it would only take one small thing for me to be losing my shit. Sure, but they just take one thing and they exacerbate it, right? Sure, sure, sure. It doesn't sure. sound like that. If the whole family nope. has agreed, like we don't talk about it. Uh, maybe they're afraid if they talk about it, it'll come back. I know, I know, which makes it again, yeah, scarier. Where it's like they they just are. Gl- I'm, I'm guessing they're just glad it's over. <sighs> it's, yeah, not a, so, it's not over in our house. That's a haunting story. A, ha- a haunting story about a haunting. That story is just like I'm just like yeah, it does give me the chills mm-hmm. just because of all the information around it. I know. I kept getting the chills, and I just the walls. Bowie, oh my god! Of I would all lose the my things. mind. Yeah, of all the things. No, thank you. Like. Oh, and then the clock falling down with no sound. <sighs> I know weird details, and you know, and in the, in the, those kind of hallmarks of certain hauntings that do come up a lot, where like the impossible weight, yeah, where yeah. it's like the chair that is um too heavy, heavier mm-hmm, than a chair mm-hmm. should be. Uh, the the weird, you know, like um sounds where th- you know things that you're visually seeing that you know in your brain make a sound, right, but don't. Those are, you know, those come up a lot in, in, in a lot of stories of oh, demonic manifestations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One thing I it didn't say or you didn't say is when he went to go spend the night at his grandmother's house, mm-hmm. did did things happen at his grandma's? I don't think so because that was not mentioned in any part of the story, and I feel like that would have been. Right. So, so just, I'm, I'm guessing no. Just in that building. Right, just, just in that, in that one just, apartment. Just, yeah, in that building. And not 
every single thing took place around the boy. But but it, but it did say when he left, it stopped. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. It said the majority. It seems like most witnesses reported that the majority of activity occurred around Peter. Yeah, it was mostly attached or focused on him. Yeah. Peter, uh. Pe- Peter, Peter, Demonator. <laughs> Peter, Peter. I probably, should, I probably should kept that in my head. Peter, Peter, pizza eater. <laughs> um, so, okay. Well, didn't care for that. Well, thank you uh, again, Thomas Hode, for pointing that our way, or we would have never probably found that story. Thanks, Thomas. You're the best. Ready for another haunting? I suppose I don't have a choice. Okay. A uh, little bit of setup on this one again. Uh, yeah, yeah, decent amount. Beep, beep, beep. Okay. Okay. James Herman sighed into the phone. What's going on? Disbelief clear in his voice. His wife's voice was staticky. The connection was not great, but he could make out something about their two children, the family alone at the house, and a popping sound. Lucille kept repeating that, popping. What was so scary about popping, James wondered. It sounded like some bottles had opened randomly like a chemical reaction, he thought. Still, he promised Lucille that he would be home in a couple of hours. The Herman family lived in Seaford, New York, a suburb on Long Island about 30 miles from New York City. Their white and green ranch-style home at 1648 Redwood Path had been built in 1953, contained three bedrooms, a bathroom, a kitchen, small dining room, a living room, and a basement that was divided between a utility room and a playroom. It was a typical 1950s-era house in a quiet, conservative neighborhood with public parks and tree-lined streets. Sweet. Yeah. In other words, it was the last place in the world anyone would expect anything extraordinary to happen. Mm -hmm. The Herman home, uh, for true fans of true horror... Also located just five miles from the infamous Amityville house. Oh, dang. Mm -hmm, Where Richard DeFeo Jr. really did kill six members of his family on November 13th, 1974. And then all kinds of alleged paranormal activity followed in the wake of those murders. Uh, Of course. So very famous story. And this story, the basis for the horror movie Poltergeist. (laughs) Sorry, that's you said the basis, Mm -hmm. but I heard the bassist. And I thought you were going to name a band. <laughs> also, like, this like story, bass player. Wow. this story inspired the bassist of Smashing Pumpkins to work in. No, yeah, yeah the bassist. Of sorry, Pumpkins. sorry to take us all out of the mood, but that was killing <laughs> That's okay. Me. It's just set up now. Now, now we're getting to the scares. Oh, yeah. Okay, I'm ready. <laughs> Time now for the tale of the Herman House Poltergeist. It was February third, nineteen fifty-eight. That morning, Lucille had gone to her job like she did most mornings. She worked as a nurse at a local hospital. She'd come home just in time for her children's return from school. The Hermans had two kids, one boy and one girl, 12-year-old James and 13-year-old Lucille, each named after each parent. And that uh, early that evening, when Miss Herman was beginning to prepare dinner, she heard it happen for the first time. One moment, life was quiet and peaceful and suburban as it always had been in their home, and then the next, chaos erupted. Various bottles containing liquid in different rooms of the house suddenly had their caps pop off, shooting into the air and bouncing off ceilings and tables. Weird. From the living room, Lucille and her two children could hear the pop of the caps, their impact against whatever they happened to hit, and the liquid splattering against the floor. Lucille quickly grabbed the phone, called her husband James, who was at his desk working for Air France in New York City. She told him to come home immediately. She told him about the popping. Something was wrong. James promised to hurry home. While he wrapped up things at the office, Lucille and the kids crept from room to room, assessing what had just happened. They discovered an open bottle of bleach in the basement and a bottle of liquid starch opened in the kitchen. In the bathrooms, caps littered the floor, bottles of shampoo, conditioner, medicine, all of them open. In the master bedroom, they found what disturbed them most of all, a bottle of holy water. The Hermans were devout Catholics. Open, tipped over, the water dripping off the table. Drip, drip, drip. How could these bottle caps have come off? Every single one of the bottles had been sealed with twist-off, twist-on, twist-off metal plastic caps. They weren't designed to be able to pop off. Nothing could have come loose, and certainly not all at the same time. What are the odds of something like this occurring naturally? James took the train back to Long Island, arrived at the house just before 7. During his commute, he couldn't stop thinking about his wife's call. Surely there was a reasonable explanation, he thought. Maybe the things they'd bought had all expired. Maybe it was uh, too humid inside the house or too hot. His mind constantly worked to solve an unsolvable puzzle. He told himself there had to be a reasonable explanation for everything, yet he couldn't shake a deep feeling of unease. Once home, James found the same evidence his family had. All the bottles without caps, all of them screw tops. But nothing had happened since the caps popped off, so James told his family that they ought to just keep quiet about it. It was a freak accident, nothing more. 
Oh, dear. Something weird had happened, sure, but that didn't mean they needed to make a big deal of it. Sometimes strange things just happen. And then life goes on, and they don't happen again. That is not true. Three days later, something did happen again. It happened on a Thursday afternoon right after the Herman children got home from school. They'd made it home a little bit before their mother and decided to spend the time relaxing before they inevitably had to do their chores. Lucille opened a magazine. Little James started to read a comic book. And then almost as soon as they sat down, it happened again. Another six bottles popped their unpoppable caps. Also, right next to young Lucille, a bottle of nail polish exploded. What? At the same time, around the house, bottles of rubbing alcohol, bleach, detergent, starch also began spraying their contents all over the place. The detergent sprayed directly onto James, who screamed that it burns as he tried to rub it out of his eyes. When James Sr. got home that night, he saw the damage, assumed these kids must have done it themselves, stopped just sh short of outright accusing them so as not to upset his wife, who was now consoling his near hysterical children. Yeah. The next day on Friday night, it happened yet again. Ugh. James Sr. was now convinced that his son was behind all of it. He suspected that James Jr. had somehow rigged the bottles to pop open in order to scare his sister. Young James was an incredibly intelligent kid. He was at the top of his class in school. Science was his favorite subject. Mm -hmm. The 12-year-old had done science experiments in front of the family before. He must be behind it all. Maybe James Sr. theorized his son had planted some carbonated capsules inside the bottles and timed it for when the family was arriving back home. James spent the entire following weekend trailing his son, closely observing him. He wanted to catch him in the act of setting up his next prank and be done with the whole upsetting mess. But then on Saturday morning, as James was reading the newspaper, he heard a loud pop behind him. This initial pop was followed by numerous others until it seemed like James Sr.'s eardrums were going to explode. When he looked around, he found a bottle of starch, a bottle of turpentine, a bottle of holy water, all without their caps, all of them rocking back and forth on their respective shelves. How? He thought he'd kept such a close eye on James Jr. all weekend. Baffled and angry, James burst into the bathroom where James Jr. was brushing his teeth, and he accused his son of rigging the bottles. James's son vigorously protested his innocence. I'm not doing it, he shouted. His father shouted back, listen, you've had your fun. Now stop it, for the love of God. And then right at that moment, a bottle of medicine moved on its own across the top of the sink and fell into the trash can below. Oh, boy. With wide, horrified eyes, James and James Jr. watched a bottle of shampoo follow and then a bottle of conditioner follow. Oh, my God. It was like watching a line of people jumping off of a high dive at a pool. One wobbling down, falling over. The next <sighs> wobbling down, falling over. James and James Jr. searched the bathroom for hidden wires. Of course, they didn't find any. They now both knew whatever was in the house was beyond physical explanations. It certainly wasn't a prank of James Jr. Unsure of what else to do, James called the Nassau County Police Department and spent the next several minutes on the phone trying to get Lieutenant Richardson to take him seriously. <laughs> at the police station, Richardson rolled his eyes and thought at first that James was a nut or a drunk or mm -hmm. both. But Officer Richardson thought to himself, the longer James spoke, the more he had to admit James didn't sound like he was drunk. He didn't sound like a crank either. He sounded earnest and scared. Richardson promised to send someone over to the Herman house to investigate. Officer James Hughes was sent to the house, and James Sr. showed him the bathroom and the bottles. And that's when right on cue, as Officer Hughes stepped through the door, some bottles in the bathroom popped off their lids. Oh, dang. Several of the odd projectiles hit Officer Hughes, <laughs> one hitting him hard enough to leave a tiny bruise on his cheekbone. Dang. Hughes had no choice but to report to his superiors that something strange was in fact going on, and Detective Joseph Tazi was now assigned to look into the case further. He read Hughes' report of the incident in the bathroom, tried to find a reasonable explanation for what had happened. Like James Sr. had felt when he first heard his wife tell him about the exploding bottles, he was skeptical. Of course he was skeptical. What was being reported was absurd. He thought a member of the house must somehow be responsible for everything that was happening. On February 11th, eight days after the first incident, Detective Tazi began an investigative vigil at the Herman house, spending his entire shift at the house waiting to observe something unexplainable. That night, a perfume atomizer tipped over, or a atom atomizer? I don't know. Beats this. me. Uh, tipped over and spilled perfume in Lucille Jr.'s bedroom, soaking her homework. When it happened, Tazi was confident that no one was in the room. After this, Tazi and the Hermans decided to assign a nickname to whatever was doing all this so they could quickly refer to it in conversation. They called it, of course, Popper. <laughs> After receiving this nickname, Popper seems to have grown uh, tired of popping random bottles. 
Going forward, the main focus became a bottle of holy water in the parents' bedroom. Over and over, a member of the family replaced the cap just to have it pop off again a couple hours later, and then something new happened. When James Sr. ran into the room after hearing a loud pop, he picked up the bottle of holy water, only to immediately drop it because it felt like it was burning his hand. Oh, wow. The following day, on February 15th, Papa revealed the capability to perform another new trick. As the Herman, Herman kids were watching television in the living room with Marie, their middle-aged second cousin, a porcelain figurine on an end table next to the couch began to wiggle on its own. Slowly, as the three watched in awe, it picked up in speed, dancing more and more erratically. Lucille Jr. reached out to grab it, and when she did, it shot two feet through the air, making a loud crashing sound as it landed on the floor. Then, to everyone's amazement, despite hearing it break, the figurine not broken. The Hermans now decided to contact Father William McLeod at the Church of St. William the Abbot. They hoped their church could help them where the police could not. Father McLeod came to the house and sprinkled holy water in each of the rooms, and this did nothing to rid the house of Popper. Dang it! By this time, word had gotten out about the Herman poltergeist, and now the family had to deal with harassment of the non-paranormal variety as well. During the day, the Herman home was now surrounded by reporters, photographers, curiosity seekers, and cameramen. As terrifying as Popper was, the coverage was sometimes scarier. The Hermans began to receive daily telephone calls, many from pranksters telling them that Martians had landed nearby, or that their house was built on an Indian burial ground, or that the Russians were tunneling under Long Island to invade New York. Their mailbox was now being flooded with messages often scrawled in untidy letters on scraps of paper. The notes often condemned them for their sins or blamed them for bringing these, quote, tricks of Satan into their lives. My God. As the Hermans lay awake at night, they could hear people walking outside the house, even through their backyard at times. People who sometimes yelled things like, repent, repent, or you'll be, so or you'll be sorry. My God. Luckily, all of this unwanted attention did attract some wanted help. Robert Zyder, a physicist from Long Island's Brookhaven National Laboratory, heard about what was going on at the Herman house and he visited the home and investigated the ongoing disturbances. From his investigation, he surmised that there were underground streams beneath the house that had created a, quote, freak magnetic field. What? Detective Tazi was skeptical. He'd never heard anything like that before. And what about the levitating ceramic figurine? What did magnets have to do with that? How could a stream or streams do that? Tazi didn't know what to make of it all. He headed to the basement where he'd been before, but now wanted to more thoroughly investigate it, see if he could determine anything that seemed magnetically off for himself. Tazi and Zyder walked downstairs together and were about to reach the bottom when a bronze statue of a horse that weighed nearly 100 pounds flew across the room and struck Tazi in the leg. What? The detective buckled and fell down the remaining stairs. James Jr. ran to get help. Yeah, I bet he did fall down. As Tazi lay at the bottom of the stairs, clutching his leg, he knew no one in the family could have made that happen. No underground streams could have made that happen. And he knew that Popper wasn't happy. A few nights later, Tazi was now going through the Herman's mail. His leg still ached from the collision with the statue. He still limped. He combed through more letters, stating wild theories about aliens or Russians, more notes from zealots telling the Hermans to repent. And then he came across a letter from a woman named Helen Connolly, who shared some advice he thought was at least worth trying. Helen wrote that she'd experienced odd events in her living room, chairs and furniture moving around when no one touched them. She thought it was a draft from her chimney and advised the Hermans to block the chimney off. She said it had worked for her. James Sr. thought the odds that, uh, they that everything they'd experienced could be explained by chimney drafts <laughs> was damn near impossible, but the Hermans were desperate enough to give it a shot. They immediately blocked off the chimney, hoping the strangest would finally come to an end, and of course that accomplished nothing. <laughs> No sooner had the workman completed the installation than James Sr. watched a porcelain figurine launch itself off of a table and smash against a desk. The figurine had managed to travel a distance of more than 12 feet through the air and hit the desk hard enough to leave a large dent in the wood. What the fuck? This was concerning. Just like when the bronze horse just about broke Detective Tazi's leg, James Sr. thought, what if that hit one of my kids? What if that hit me or my wife? Popper could kill someone. Mm-hmm. He's getting mad. On February 20th, another figurine smashed against the desk. A bottle of ink popped its screw cap, then sailed into the air and splashed its contents on the wall. Streaks of black ran down the wall, and Tazi, who witnessed the entire thing, thought the ink resembled blood. Was it a warning? After this incident, the Herman family decided they needed a break, and they left to spend a few nights with the relative. Tazi, now completely obsessed with this case, stayed in their house overnight while they were away. Oh, come on. And witnessed even more disturbing uh, occurrences. On February 24th, Tazi woke up in the middle of the night to silence. He'd been sleeping on the couch in the living room. 
and while he didn't hear anything, something suddenly felt off. Then as he sat in the silent darkness, utterly alone in this haunted home, he heard an enormous crash from upstairs. He ran to James Jr.'s room and saw that a bookcase had tipped over onto James's bed. Had he been asleep in his bed, it could have crushed him. The next night, a record player moved 15 feet across the living room floor on its own. Also in the living room, a small statue of the Virgin Mary crashed into a mirror, shattering it. Uh-oh. A row of encyclopedias fell out of the bookshelf. A heavy glass centerpiece from the dining room flew up and struck a cupboard, chipping away a piece of molding before falling to the floor. A globe shot down the hallway into James Jr.'s room, just missed, and it just missed hitting Tazi, who actually had to duck to avoid being struck. What was happening? The following day, with the family's permission, a few reporters came inside to see if they could verify all the rumors of this poltergeist activity. A newspaper photographer named John Gold from the London, London Evening News witnessed his flashbulbs lift off a table, fly through the air. They struck a wall and shattered as if Popper were saying, no pictures. This same day, Detective Tazi, uh, uh, Detective, excuse me, Tazi and the Herman family, who had now returned home, began to hear knocking on the walls. Random knocks would be heard all over the house. Sometimes they would occur in quick succession, with each knock sounding like it was coming from opposite sides of the room. Are they ready to get the fuck out or what? No one could figure out what any of this meant. As the days wore on, these knockings became longer, sounded more violent. Was Popper trying to communicate and growing frustrated that no one could understand what it was trying to say? News of the Herman haunting now reached Duke University. What? Specifically their parapsychology laboratory led by Dr. J.B. Ryan. Not a widely known department, the researchers had over the course of 10 years come to believe that under the right conditions, certain people could influence the behavior of objects around them without touching them. They called this phenomenon psychokinesis or PK. Dr. Ryan sent his assistant, Dr. J. Gaither Pratt to New York to investigate the Herman house. Pratt arrived at the house on February 26th Immediately, he believed that someone in the house was unknowingly causing these strange incidents. The Duke researchers had found that in most circumstances in which PK occurred, an adolescent child, usually a girl, sometimes a boy, was almost always the focal point of the activity. They believed it was possible that certain people were most capable of psychokinesis during the height of puberty. They also believed that the young person was never aware that they were the one causing it, and the bewilderment of the adults around them only increased their anxiety, which in turn increased the amount of activity. In the case of the Herman house, Pratt determined that James Jr. was present during more than three quarters of the incidents and for many of them, the sole witness. So he believed that young James was the root of everything that was happening. Many others still either living in the house or called in to help with or investigate the disturbances, such as Father William McLeod, were not sold. They believed something else entirely was inside the home. Something out of this world, something that had crawled out of another realm to wreak havoc on this one. As evidence, Father McLeod cited vials of holy water in the home, which continued to feel as though they might burn you when you touched them. And then, when both Father McLeod and Pratt came to the house together to investigate, to try and determine which of their theories was correct, the activity in the home went silent. What? Was Popper mocking their quest for answers? Several days later, on March 2nd, Papa returned. Uh. The Hermans were eating dinner in the dining room when a dish vaulted from the kitchen cabinet, shattered on the floor. Then from above, they heard a crash as the night table flipped over in James Jr.'s room. Two days later, a bowl of flowers slid down the dining room table, jumped into the air. A bookcase turned end over end in the cellar. A week later on March 10th, when Mrs. Herman, James Jr. and Lucille were getting ready for bed, when James Sr. was away on business and McLeod and Pratt were both downstairs, everyone heard a loud crash in the cellar. They ran downstairs, saw an innocuous bottle of bleach with its lid missing. Oh boy. They'd all heard a much bigger sound than that, a real crash, but that was the only thing they could find to miss. They all began to wonder if the stress had forced them to start imagining things. They couldn't understand where the unexplained events began, where their imagination or madness ended, and then nothing. A popped bottle of bleach. That was the last disturbance. What? The Herman family had experienced 67 disturbances, minimum, between February 3rd and March 10th. They'd been visited by detectives, building inspectors, electricians, plumbers, firemen, parapsychologists, every person with a piece of advice to dispense, and no one had been able to produce a satisfying explanation for what had happened. What the heck? Right when they felt like their collective sanity was going to break, it all ended. And the family just tried to get back to living their previously normal lives. James later told an Associated Press reporter, I don't think there is a definite solution. 
It was just one of those things with no rhyme or reason to it, but there was a definite physical force behind it. The events of the Herman House were dramatized years later in a screenplay that eventually became the 1982 movie Poltergeist. Lucille and James Sr. have both since passed away. James and Lucille Jr., still alive, continue to reckon with what happened to them. I never saw Poltergeist. I had my own nightmares, Lucille told a reporter in 2012. Her parents sold a home many decades ago, and it's had several owners since the Hermans. None have reported further disturbances. Oh my god, but how could you be in that house and not think, what was that? What? Isn't that so weird, too? Kind of very similar stories. And then just, poof, Yep. Gone. Things Over. start to happen, lots of things, heavily witnessed things, and then gone. I don't like the no explanation. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, I know all these don't, but man... I know, it's unsettling. It just because it feels like it was building to something and then Right. Where I think our brains are programmed for stories to build towards a uh, a, a climactic crescendo. Yeah. The, the big denouement, the big ending. Yeah. And uh, you know, these these stories don't don't like real life, that's not no. how things often happen. In, in the movie versions, right. Crescendo. But in these like actual, you know, supposed real uh paranormal events, there's no rules. <laughs> Well, life has no rules, Dan. Right, right. So let's look at a few. This first I, picture is the Herman ha- the Herman House, sixteen forty eight Redwood Path, Seaford, New York. Yeah, totally normal house. Yep, just a little innocuous house. Uh, now this is interesting. This next picture is a, a Newsday article on the Herman House with, with reporter Dave Kahn claiming to witness a porcelain figure slam into a wooden desk. So when those reporters came in, you know, numerous claim they did see things, and they actually you know wrote about it, reported like, yeah, we saw things too. Just both of these stories having so many eyewitnesses so, also really trips me out. Mm-hmm. Uh, here's another maybe uh, more recent picture uh, of the Hermat. Oh, wait. No, that's the doll from uh, Poltergeist. That's the doll that terrorized me as a child. Oh, that's it? I've never mm-hmm. – I don't think I've ever seen Poltergeist. I don't know. I don't know that it holds up. I, I haven't I haven't seen it recently. All right. I, oh, I spe- speaking of movies, just really quick. Yeah. I have been watching the remake uh, during my lunch breaks of um, Pet Cemetery. Okay, so and I really like it. I watched the original. Oh, I was like, you're still watching. No, I watched the original. Great, yeah, it holds up. I think, and then watching the remake with John Lithgow, who I love. Okay, and so far, halfway through it, definitely holds up. Okay, well, there you have it. So both good. Uh, I'm, I'm not watching any TV. <laughs> so here's another news clipping. This is a has a picture of Detective Tazi and the Herman family. I kept feeling something behind me that whole Ugh. story. I was like, is something touching me? It's really uncomfortable. And then this is a photo, obviously altered, but just a super creepy, odd photo of the Herman family. Uh, yeah. A little blurry around the it's Just, yeah, just like, ee. I thought I saw it move this morning. But I mean, you, you my saw imagination. I thought I saw something move in the blurred parts of the photo. Well, it's almost just like a blown out, overexposed photo. Yeah, it reminds me of um, Stephen King's It. Uh huh. Of what I imagined in my head when I read that book as a kid, yeah. where there would be incidents when they'd be looking at old photos, and all of a sudden Pennywise would show up in the photo, or weird people would start to move in the photos, and that's always creeped me out. Just the thought that would of like, be looking, so creepy. Oh yeah, looking at a photo, and all of a sudden one of the people in the photo just goes Ehh? and just like turns and looks at you. <laughs> Joe no, just faded it out, and that was enough for me to be like, "Is it moving?" Uh, you know <sighs> what I find interesting about that second story? Yeah. Is the poltergeist activity around a, like a kid going through puberty? Because our kids are 12 and a half and 14 right. and a half. And so could be our kids, right? Because when yeah. I talk about things in our house, sounds that I hear, mm-hmm. what am, it's always from Kyler's room. I was super <laughs> fucking freaked out like two or three nights ago. Well, it doesn't help that he says weird shit in his sleep all the time. <laughs> I know. Like we, nightly. We really need to set up recorders in their room. Yeah, some okay. kind of like uh, sound. Like, like there's no, I like, just want a GoPro because I want to. Mm. I want to know what's happening. Who are they talking to? I know it's weird, but maybe it's we weird. don't want to know. Well, that would be the worst. Yeah, but but my point is, is that all of the activity that I hear, yeah, in Kyler's room is directly above ours in the way our house is set up, right? Right. But I only hear activity in his room, and mm-hmm. so it was Friday to Saturday, I think, or Saturday to Sunday. <laughs> I heard footsteps but i kept waiting for him to like go to the bathroom i like listen i listen for the whole thing i know what it sounds like when he gets up to go to the bathroom yeah i'm a mom and i can't sleep through any of our kids waking up oh my god i'm, so, I'm having the worst uh thoughts go through my head that like we find out months later now that you've just been constantly listening to him beat off that's not what it sounds like you <laughs> idiot how do footsteps sound like him jerking off i don't know how he does it <laughs> you're an idiot that doesn't even make sense okay all right 
If I heard like a thumping against the wall, maybe like like his elbow hitting, but like yeah. it is for sure the sound of someone getting out of bed. Yeah. You might be getting up to go to the bathroom. I never hear the bathroom door open and close. I don't hear footsteps in the bathroom. I don't hear the toilet flush. I don't hear the sink turn on to wash his hands. I hear none of that. Well, that's probably just because he doesn't wash his hands up when he's done. And he doesn't what are you talking about? Our kid is a germaphobe. He is a, like, even in like the middle yeah, of him. Maybe not in the middle of the night. No, think about it. When he was little and we would have to yeah. wake him up when we were sleep training and like potty training, we would or like past potty training, but like to avoid yeah. bedwetting would, you know, like around that young age, we would wake him up in the middle of the night and Kyler would hardly be awake. We'd have to carry him to the bathroom and he yeah. would still I have to wash my hands. True. He did go through that phase. Also told us that he pretended to wash his hands for an entire year. That is true. And didn't. Didn't wash his hands for a whole year and would go through this elaborate ruse where he would actually, it's so dumb. And he, so and he, funny. And he laughed about it. He oh recognized God, it's it dumb. so funny. He would actually turn the water on and leave it on for the amount of time he thought he would have it on if he were washing his hands, uh -huh. but just not wash his hands. Because he thought he was being so sneaky. What a weird thing to try and get away with. So, I mean, a lot okay, of, but lot still, of things but are possible. Hear, okay, but I don't hear the toilet flushing. I know. I, I have, I'm telling you. Uh, yeah. Who knows? Who knows? Yeah. Why? Why won't you just believe me? Because I don't want to believe it. I don't want to believe that there's something in our house. But why, it makes, why would I want to believe that? <laughs> it makes sense now. And Monroe had friends sleeping over this past weekend. And the one night I felt so much like anxiety in the house. I just was like, oh, my God. And as I was lying in bed, I don't want to say the friend's name, but I was like, oh, my God. Is it her? Because then she wasn't there the next night and I was fine. Maybe she's an evil kid. No, but just like... Yeah. Maybe. I don't know. Keep an eye on that one. Well, I might. I just It just felt different. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I don't know. I did not care for it. That's all. That's okay. all, Dan. Okay. One of these days, something is going to happen to you in that house that you're going to be... you're not going to believe me. I'm going to absolutely believe you. Oh, okay. I want it to happen because I want you to be like, okay, I'm sorry. It's really... I want an apology. <laughs> well, I, I would love to say that I hope that I see a demon or something so I can apologize to you, but I don't want to see I have seen anything. I don't want you to see something. That would be worse. I just want you to hear the footsteps. You probably can't see it because it's probably inside you. No. I, don't, I think it's there's some... to you. Well, it feels like there's something in our room recently. You. <laughs> You're so funny. Oh, you're in the room. <laughs> All right. What kind of stories do you have? <sighs> you're a little too resistant this week. No, I'm not. I'm op I'm open to this stuff. I just don't want it to be in our house. Well, no one no one wants it in their house. No you, one. You do. <laughs> no, I don't. I want it less than you want it. <laughs> okay. Yay, yay, yay. I'll punch you. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is our life. This is what happens when you've been on lockdown with the same person for months on end. What are you talking about? You were, you were talking about punching me long before <laughs> quarantine. Oh, I just was trying to justify it. <laughs> I was trying to make it relatable. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, we have a tiny little update on our book for this week. Okay. Okay. So obviously so pumped about the book. Just a reminder. So this episode airs, you know, at midnight on July 14th. So this is your last and final reminder. You guys are most likely going to hear this episode on the 15th, but you have to send in your releases. At this point, you should have heard from Kate and I. If for some reason you heard your, your story read, during the My Story portion of the show, and you didn't get a release form for, uh, from us, and it's not in your junk email, email us again at book at scaredtodeathpodcast.com, and we'll make sure that you have the right form, okay? Because we, we want all these stories to make it into the book. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're super excited. Now, a lot of people have been saying, like, well, how do I get the book? What's the next step? How, how does this work? great questions. So how it does work is that as of today, when this episode drops, you will be able to pre-order the book and you'll be able to pre-order it until the end of the month, which is July 31st. And then at that point, the pre-order will close and you will not be able to buy the book until it shows up again after it's been made in the store. So again, pre-orders July 14th through July 31st. So when does the book come out, right? That yeah. would be the next logical question. So the printers, just like in total transparency, are telling us about eight to 10 weeks before they can make the books. So barring any crazy COVID shit or anything else 2020 yeah. wants to throw at us, theoretically, you would have the books by Halloween. And, and we feel really confident about that. But again, I mean, I have felt confident about a lot of things this year. And then not so much COVID-19. So, um, you know, if the Rona gets us, 
it'll be a little bit delayed, but but we should be okay. I, I think people really know how to navigate the situation now. Yeah. And the most important and most exciting part yeah. is that if you pre-order the book, guess who's going to sign it for you? We are. Sweet. So the only way to get your book autographed is to do a pre-order. If you don't do a pre-order and you order the book after it's available in the store, you'll just get the standard book. If you order it from July 14th through July 31st, we're going to sign it for you. I hope like so many people do it. I hope Me I, too. I hope my hand hurts. I'm excited to see it. I hope your hand breaks. You have to sign so many books. <laughs> Me too. Break your hand. I'm excited. I'm excited. Uh, uh, Logan was talking about the cover design this morning. And yeah, yeah I'm, I'm excited for it. Yeah, it's going to be very cool. It's going to be, you know, a traditional book. Book cover, pretty inside, little bios about the authors. I mean, we're going all the way, y'all. Sweet. Sweet. Okay. You got your squish? I got, I got my squish. He's over here somewhere. Right there. Right there. I gotta find you a new guy. He's, he's, fading. he's fading. He looks a little dirty. You know? Okay. Here we go. Hey, Lindsay and Dan. It took me a long time to submit this story, but here we are. My roommate and I have been friends for going on a decade now, and we've experienced some whack shit, and we wanted to share the story with you guys. We listen to your podcast every week. Thank you. Thank you. And are so happy to contribute a story into your brains. I hope you guys can make sense out of this, as we still cannot. I will be using some fake names in the story, as I haven't told all the people who probably should know what happened about what happened. So buckle up, buckaroos. I was house-sitting in the boonies of Vermont, which isn't that surprising, as most of Vermont is considered the boonies. <laughs> I was watching a cat, and I wasn't required to spend any of the nights in the house, but there was a game room and a hot tub, so of course I was in. The house was very big, with an ancient-looking dining room, an open kitchen, and old pieces of furniture everywhere I looked. I thought it was a funky, antique kind of place. As the house owner, Jean, led me through a large place, we passed through a hallway that linked to the kitchen. On one side of the linking hallway, which was about five feet long, was a door to a bathroom and across a door to the basement. I looked down the steps of the basement and darkness seemed to be oozing upwards from the door. Jean chuckled and closed the door. Another creepy basement. Mm -hmm. There's nothing down there but the cat box and you won't have to change that one. And so we kept on touring. The basement gave me some bad vibes, but I was making some cash and I had access to a hot tub, so I forgot about it easily enough. It was supposed to be an easy job and a good time. A couple days in, and I had barely spent more than three hours a day in the house. For some reason, I barely felt comfortable using the hot tub. Every time I'd get in, I'd get the feeling that someone was watching me. <sighs> One night, I was going to spend the night there just to give some lovin' to the cat. <laughs> a friend, Hales, was supposed to join me for pizza and some gossip. The usual teenage girl kind of thing. She ended up canceling on me last minute, and as I was in the kitchen writing, I was sitting by the window and the, as the sun went down. By 11 o'clock, I was debating whether or not I should stay. My bag was already ready to go on the ground next to me. The area I was sitting in, across from the room from the door to the antique dining room, uh, almost every other light was off in the house, and I began getting a burning feeling in my stomach. I looked up from my laptop and closed the lid carefully. Something was watching me. I couldn't see anything, but I knew it was there. I stood from the tall chair and landed gently on the ground, trying not to make a sound. I looked out the window and I didn't see anything. I slowly turned my head to the door to the dining room and felt my stomach tighten more in fear. The cat was sitting at the door, staring straight in, her head tilted up. I tiptoed over to the door, grabbing my phone off the charger, mm -hmm. typing 911 into my phone. I looked at the door and my stomach was now on fire. My heart constricted as my eyes fell on the form of a color of pure darkness in the corner of the dining room. Ugh. The moonlight literally seemed to avoid this thing. Tears pricked my eyes as I flicked the menu up on my phone to turn on the flashlight. I shined it up quickly towards the figure and it drifted away from the light, quickly floating or shifting almost to the other side of the room to the corner across from the door. At that point, I knew in my gut that whatever it was, I could not stay to find out. A tear ran down my cheek as I used my foot to kind of shuffle the cat back away from the door, and I closed the door on the being. I grabbed my duffel and my keys and noped the fuck out of there, <laughs> still feeling the burning sensation now climbing up into my throat. I called my dad, who lived about three miles away, and asked him if I could stay with him and my mother for the night. He didn't ask questions and set up the couch for me to sleep on. 
I hugged him tight when I got there and tried to explain what I had saw, what I had seen. At that point, I didn't want to go back to the house, mm -hmm. but Jean was going to be gone for three more days and I needed to do the cat box one more time. So I called Hales and to have her meet me there the next day. I arrived at the house at about 4 p.m. From here on in is where I will, you will be begging me to leave. I am seriously the worst, Darren. In the back <laughs> seat was a Ouija board. I had used many... I had used in many previous fucked up situations. Hales rolled her eyes when she saw it, but I explained to her the situation and she said, okay, why not? We ordered pizza and sat in the living room. And so I thought about how we should do the Ouija board. Mm -hmm. We needed a third person. So I called my bestie and now roommate Lex to join us in our session. She lives down the road from this place. I checked on the litter box and the food upstairs and, quick and quickly went to the basement to check on the litter box there. I locked the door on my way back up. We decided to set up in the dining room. At this point, I don't feel any bad vibes or any semblance of messed up energy. So I'm hoping in my heart that we're not going to get anything off our Ouija board. Mm -hmm. I turn off every light in the house and we leave our phones in another room. I light a candle and set it out on the old dining room table. I pull out my Ouija board and lie it on the table. Lex looks down, sits looking down out the window and Hale sits opposite. I sit at the head of the table. Lex immediately requests to switch spots and Hales begrudgingly switches with her. As I started this session, I feel a little silly. I ask questions and as my humor side often shows, shows through my spirituality, I chuckle at the serious looks on my friends' faces. Hales then cracks a smile and I recognize it's time to get a little bit more serious. After 20 minutes of asking questions, giving each other side glances, and Hale sighing, I give up and stand up, breaking the circle, and I quickly move the planchette to goodbye, and I look at the girl shrugging. Okay, I guess mm -hmm, we can take a break mm -hmm. and then move into a different area. The basement, perhaps? Lex immediately shakes her head, and Hale laughs, and I ask her to lead the way back to the living room. She refuses to be the leader, and I roll my eyes and to begin the, the way back to the living room. We moved very slowly towards the door and then through the hallway. I had my hand on the couch and I felt Hale's grip on my shoulder tighten. And that's when shit went to hell. <laughs> Lex let out a blood curdling scream as we heard bam, bam, bam up from the basement stairs. It was deafening and the door blasted open like it was a damn leaf in the matter of seconds. Lex screamed more and jumped on me, as did Hales. I backed away from the hallway, shocked. Hales looked at my face, and I'm certain I looked freaked out because she began to look so concerned. I moved them out onto the front porch quickly. Lex's grip on my arm was like a handcuff. Her nails bit into my wrist, and she looked like she was about to cry. I looked through the windows on the porch to the open door, and I felt it again. My stomach started burning. I told them that if they did not hear from me, uh, I, I, sorry, I told them if they heard me shout to go down the stairs to the car and get out of there. I grabbed my knives from my bag as I thought someone had broken into the house. Now I'm six feet tall and 270 pounds. I was uh -huh. not about to let my friends get murdered. I cleared the first floor and then looked down the stairs to the basement. I begrudgingly went down and cleared it. I shouted while walking around. If someone's down here, come out now. I'm armed and I will stab the fuck out of you. <laughs> <laughs> I was screaming this as I tried to calm my nerves. And I looked at these two heavy doors that led into a garage and to the tool room. They were wide open. A cold chill ran down my spine as I quickly went to the garage, cleared it. I closed the door and noted that it made a loud squealing noise while opening and closing. How did I not notice it had opened before? When I went back upstairs, I turned on the kitchen light and met the girls on the back porch. Hales and I were trying to figure out where we were going to go. Okay, let's get out of here, I said, trying to herd my friends toward the door. But Lex wouldn't budge. I'm tired, she said. Yeah, we'll sleep when we get the fuck out of here, I said. But she shook her head. Nope, I'm going to bed. She said in this determined, stern voice. Lex was not even five feet tall and 110 pounds soaking wet. Well, I'm always the let's go do dumb shit in this haunted sp space, she's always erred on the side of caution. She's always the first to get the fuck out. I was surprised and annoyed that now was the time she was going to be a Darren, because that <laughs> meant if she did, we did too. Although, Hale still thinks I should have carried her out. I was definitely still freaked out and shaking from adrenaline. Lex opened the door that led to the stairs up to the bedrooms, but I never told her where to go. How did she know to go up there? I looked for the cat to make sure I could keep her downstairs like she always was. I met the girls upstairs after triple checking the locks and everything. 
Lex chose the room that Jean's kids used to sleep in. It had a giant bed that fit all three of us easily. I still wanted to leave, but Lex was unshakable in her resolve. No matter what we told her or what she thought she saw, she was staying there. Mm. I slept closest to the door where I sat up all night. Around 3 a.m., I noticed the automatic lights going on and off in front of the door, which we had barricaded. After five minutes of this happening, I wanted to get up and find out what it was. My first instinct is almost always fight. I was still shaking and scared out of my mind. I went to stand, but a hand grabbed me and pulled the back of my shirt and wrenched me back down. Lex's eyes were open and she stared at me. Don't leave. Stay here, she said. I was absolutely about to shit myself. I meditated on the edge of the bed for the majority of the night, trying to regain some ounce of calmness. Lex left that morning at 7 a.m. Hales and I stayed behind for two more hours trying to figure out ways that the events of the previous night could have happened. Hales told me that morning that she'd actually thought I was just trying to prank her, but when she saw my face and I was freaking out, she knew I wasn't joking. I'm still not sure what happened. Maybe my best friend was manipulated by what was in the house. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was an actual human breaking in. Either way, I'm never going back. What's Lex's deal? Possessed. Something, something was calling her back. If, if she's clearly the one that always wants to GTFO, why the, would the, she? That doesn't. Oh, you mean like normally? Yeah, normally. Right, and right, that, right, right, that right. One oh, time. yeah, yeah, exactly. And then this time just, yeah, refuses and then just like, yeah, weirdly like grabbing people and making them stay and yeah. wanting to take things further and further and further. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, just, I just kept thinking about like the little shadow thing early in the story. Right. Uh, that you like uh, shine the flashlight of her of the phone on. And it like avoids the light. Uh, that just sounds to me like what happens. That That's like what would happen to me. It would be like minute, just a little bit, but just enough for you to know something's, something's up. there. Mm-hmm. I, I, yeah, I'm kind of torn on like the bringing the Ouija board back because part of me does ah. get it. I know you would not like, but I mean, I get the curiosity where if you see something yeah and you're like god i feel something this is weird and then you want to communicate with that thing which could be the worst idea you've ever had right but also i i get i get the lure i get the lure i know i get it i i wouldn't mind having somebody come to our house and have them figure it out i don't want to be there i don't mm. want it to attach to me but if someone could tell me what was there and if they could clear it <laughs> it's, it's got to be a twofold you can't just tell me what's there find it and remove it Ugh. Did I tell you about how I started playing a Ouija board uh, on your side of the bed when you sleep? Mm, cool. I, I can't, never mind. Did I tell you how I started putting crystals in your pillowcase? <laughs> how mad would you be if you woke up in the middle of the night oh my God. And, and I was on the floor with candles right next to your side of the bed playing on a Ouija board by myself? Listen, if you do that... On a scale of... Well, also, you can't Ouija board by yourself. You need more than one person. I can do whatever I want. Okay. If you want to do it... Please set up a camera first and like I will because I will lose my shit, but it'll be worth it. <laughs> Green light. Okay. Green Good light. To know. Good to know. Okay. 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 I realized that I put my Gosh. stories in here in the wrong order. Oh, okay. Uh, so pardon me if I look a little to <sighs> shovel. Oh, and, I forgot, and I forgot to even ask earlier uh, how many stories. I know you did a weird thing when we started the episode. You just like. Phew. I know. I went right into it. I, I, I usually have a little note. Remind, I'm, I'm big on my reminder notes. Yeah. And I, I had in my prep skipped that reminder note. I know. So I felt a little choppy. because I was sorry like, wait, what's that. happening? Yeah. So, sorry, uh, creeps and peepers. I, but, I tried to give you like a cue. because so I was I, like, oh, I have a story from there too. And you uh, still yeah. didn't say, oh, honey. I was focused on some other things we're working on this show. But yes. So how many, how many stories? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, that was one. That was one. And we have another one. Okay. And then I have a little bit of an update. Do you remember our story from the- And then the fan thing, or is that separate? Fan thing's at the very end. Okay, okay, got it. I have this this like tiny, brief little mm, compendium. Got it. Do you remember the- Well, I'll tell you later. Okay. Stay tuned. Okay. Okay. All right. So, off to Canada. Okay. Ready, spaghetti. Uh, a possible encounter with a Wendigo. Oh. Mm-hmm. Hi, my name is Joel. I'm from Winnipeg, Manitoba. I've never been there, have you? Uh, I have, actually. Yeah, hmm. there's a comedy club there called Rumors. I, oh, I, I performed that's a terrible it. name for a comedy club. <laughs> it was a fun club. I was there uh, yeah, a couple years ago. Sounds so, like, several years ago. Sounds like a rock venue. Well, immediately I hear Bonnie Raitt. Mm. Yeah, mm -hmm. in my head. Okay, carrying on. Uh, he says, I won't waste much of your time, but I would love to say my girlfriend and I love your comedy and have listened Thank to you. all of your stuff over and over. Oh, thank you. He's like kind of funny. 
So now for my story of my experience of what I believe to have been with a Wendigo. I try to forget this night because every time I recall the events, it brings up more questions and I end up doing more digging. I totally get that. Mm -hmm. So he, I love this. He starts with an explanation of what a Wendigo is. This is a good reminder that the Wendigo is a mythological man-eating creature or evil spirit from the folklore of the First Nations Algonquin tribes Mm -hmm. based in the northern forests of Nova Scotia, the east coast of Canada, Great Lakes region of Canada, and the United States. Yep. He cites Wikipedia. Bless him. (laughs) Good job, Joel. This was my fifth year I went out to the Winnipeg Folk Festival in boring old Winnipeg, Manitoba. That year, I was 23 years old. Folk Festival is one of the only events during the summer that really interested me as I love folk music and having drinks with good company. All of my friends were so excited to go. We bought our tickets in advance and we were talking nonstop about all of the silliness and drinking we would get into. It's Friday, the second day into the festival, and also the biggest day to go, as the artists performing on Friday were the biggest and most well-known artists. That Friday was so hot. It rained most of the day, too. The rain felt good as my friends and I all waited for the show to start. There were some technical difficulties due to the weather, and this made the show start about an hour late. But we didn't care in the slightest, as we were all smoking some of the finest weed we could get our 23-year-old paws on. The show started, and it was amazing. We were all screaming and hollering and buying shots of rum from the vendors. After the show winded down, everyone decided to run to the portable bathrooms to take a quick leak before heading back to the tenting area. Here's where things in the night get a little weird. I go to the portable washrooms, and I'm waiting for one of them to show the vacant side. Mm -hmm. My friend and I are chatting about the show, when out of the corner of my eye, I see what looks to be like two really big legs moving through the brush. I almost had to wipe my eyes. I I couldn't believe what I was noticing. My friend saw that I wasn't paying attention and said, hello, and I just apologized, explaining that I I, I thought I saw a black giraffe walking through the trees (laughs) (laughs) behind the portable washrooms in the darkness. She laughed and asked me just how much weed I had been smoking that night, as if weed could cause me to see a monster or something. I didn't think much of it, and we all headed back to the campgrounds. When we all arrived back to the field, where my my friends, being the heroes that they are, had already started a campfire, which was awesome, because it was turning out to be a cold night. We each cracked open a beer and started looking to each other for our plans for the evening. Now, most of my friends were looking for some mind-altering drugs for the evening, but I decided beer would be good enough for me that night. I was also feeling a little freaked out by what I thought I had seen, and I didn't want to push my luck with psychedelics. Mm -hmm. My friends went off into the field that had campfires everywhere. The night was really dark, but all of the fires and the moonlight felt like it lit it up enough, though, uh, lit it up enough that I thought, hey, I'll go for a little walk by myself while my buddies are out there looking for fun in the night. I start walking towards this big hill close to the field called Pope's Hill. There were always festival goers partying on the hill, and this wasn't anything new. I figured, why not join in on some of that fun? I was on the hill dancing to electronica, (laughs) blaring through a boombox while the hill was just lit up with people wearing glow sticks. After a while, I got sick of dancing and decided to keep walking. I looked over at the highway road and saw the moonlight shining off of it. And for whatever reason, I felt compelled to walk down the highway. Mm -hmm. It still gives me chills when I remember this. I remember thinking to myself that it wasn't wise to leave the festival grounds as it was past midnight. But I walked down the other side of Pope's Hill and up to the highway. As I got closer to the field on the complete opposite side of the folk fest, I see what looks like three people running through the grass. It's not really tall grass, but it's tall enough that if you were lying down, no one would see you there. Mm-hmm. I don't recognize the voice, but hey, this is a, a muc of sorry, I don't recognize the voices, but hey, this is a music festival, I thought. You're bound to make a friend or two with complete strangers, even if it is in the middle of the night. I just start walking up closer, but by the time I see them again, they are much further into the grass than I thought. Just waving for me to come further in. Something then felt really not right about that and I decided that maybe I should just go back and see where my friends were at in their search for drugs. But I also had to take a piss. So I walked up to the brush and as I start to pee, I see through the brush what looks like a deer approaching me from the opposite side of the brush. Now I live in Canada, so this doesn't seem that odd to me. But then the deer stops and is almost just staring at me. I feel kind of compelled to stare back at it. The figure then seems to almost morph and get taller. 
meanwhile still maintaining the antlers of a deer. I feel frozen stiff and slowly zip up my pants, the figure now appearing to be about human height and even a bit taller than myself. At this point, every part of my mind wants to believe this is some kind of joke or trick of the mind. Mm -hmm. After all, there were those kids that I just saw waving, waving to me. Maybe they are pranking a stranger for fun. But no, the eyes of this thing seem to glow, although still remaining jet black. I snapped out of whatever trance it felt like I was in and yelled, it, I'll get you if you're trying to scare me. And just like that, I started to run, and the figure ran into the forest, snapping branches as it goes. The scariest part was how it ran. It looked like it was just taking really long strides, almost as if it was moving gracefully through the woods on ice skates. Needless to say, I ran back to my friends the whole way screaming for help. I couldn't understand what I saw. Even weirder was my friends claimed I had been gone for three hours. Weird. And since I couldn't recall what time I had left for my walk, I had no way of disputing how long I was actually gone for. Flash forward to five years. I'm with my lovely girlfriend, and she is just as into the paranormal as I am. I've told her this story once or twice and a few friends as well, but we both get uncomfortable hearing it. I decided now that it's been some time I want to delve back into that night, so I did some research on Wendigos. I found out that Wendigos apparently can cause, aud can cause audio hallucinations if they are believed in and are said to lure in unsuspecting victims with voice mimicry similar to the predator. Wendigos are said to have been a man at one point but cannibalized and their spirit carries forth in death as a malicious entity. I also did some research into Bird's Hill campgrounds and found out that right at the end of Pope's Hill, where I was walking, was a pioneer settler's graveyard and that there are approximately 250 burials there. Many of the souls buried there died of cold exposure and disease. Mm. There was a doctor who helped many of the graveyard occupants before they succumbed to their demise. It is said that the doctor is also buried there in these historical grounds. There is no more space available, and it is asked that no one steps foot on these grounds at night. You can be visiting during the day, but you cannot go at night. Several sightings of people running through the surrounding fields have been spotted there over the years. But this only makes me feel that what I saw that night may have been a real-life nightmare. Geek. Yeah, that's hard to process. Just seeing some like creature shift shapes and stuff, you know, mm -hmm. like, I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm like my, the skeptical reflex wants to be like, that's some great weed. <laughs> you know, like, like, uh, there's definitely one <laughs> totally. it's like, oh my God. Um, I don't like weed that makes me hallucinate. Uh, uh, that's, yeah, to me, weed, that's not great weed. Weed is not supposed to make you like hallucinate in a powerful, I've, I've never hallucinated in any like real, like maybe lights look a little bit different, but nothing close to like uh, other sites, like true psychedelics mm -hmm. where you're seeing things that uh, aren't necessarily there in the way that you're seeing. I don't do psychedelics. I've never done psychedelics because yeah. I don't like the, I don't like the idea of completely losing control because there have mm -hmm. been enough times that I've been high on other drugs that I have felt paranoid. Mm -hmm. And my concern is that. I take a trip on shrooms and that like I really freak out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If you, you go know. with that mindset, you a good chance you will. Well, I know. And a really good friend of ours, you know, who yeah. I'm talking about, he has pretty severe anxiety and he's always telling me that microdosing on shrooms is the best thing he's ever done for his anxiety. Mm -hmm. You, you, you wanna, like shrooms. I want a macro dose this week. Um, actually, it'll be the, by the time this comes out, it'll be the previous week. No? Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway. 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 Uh, yeah. That, yeah, that, that is, it, that is a crazy, I mean, who knows? Who the fuck? Ah. Well, for anybody who cares about what Dan was just referencing for the 200th oh. episode of Time Suck. Yeah. I'll be, he'll, he'll on he'll shrooms. be doing some shrooms. Um, that's great. But yeah, that that's, yeah, yeah. Who who knows? Who knows what he saw that night in that, you know, that pioneer cemetery out in the dark by the music festival. I, I mean, I do think like, 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 let's say these creatures, let's go with hypothesis that it's sure. real. And, and then there was a music festival. What a better time if you, if you don't want to be discovered for whatever reason. What what better time to kind of like blend in the night when when you got a bunch of like party goers around and stuff and people are doing things? It's like if you if you don't want to be verified for reasons that I don't need to understand, yeah, be a good time to like pop in. Oh, for the little like when for, for, for the creature. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't know if I think that they're that intelligent that they would like Who map knows, it out though? like that because also he says that people have seen activity on Pope's Hill mm -hmm. for years. People yeah. the people running through the field that freaked me out the most actually. Because I could probably justify a way, like if I'm squatting in a corner peeing, 
Yeah. My little corner of the woods. And a deer like, looks weird. That? Yeah. Right. And deer just kind of like naturally with shadows, it can look very sure, peculiar. Sure. Okay. But the people being like, come on. Yeah. 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 Oh. Uh, now, do you remember a couple of weeks ago in episode 42, uh, I shared two stories from Hawaii? Yes. Okay. And one mm-hmm. of them was uh, a Pearl City. It was a, a yes, Navy yes. base. Uh-huh, uh-huh, okay. Uh-huh. So I have some verification okay. that it is definitely super fucking haunted okay. there. Okay. Not that we were questioning sure, it. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. But I thought this was awesome. Dear Lord and Lady of Fright, Fear, and the Suck, this Wednesday, before the release of the Rake episode, my girlfriend Jordan and I were listening to the Demoniac episode. When you mentioned Hawaii stories, I thought, hell yeah. But as you went on, things took a turn for the both of us. You mentioned that it was an army cat living in Oahu, and I'm an army cat, and (laughs) I live on Oahu. Then you mentioned it was Pearl City, and there are a few housing places in Pearl City, so we're like, okay, wow. Then you said it was on the peninsula, and all I could think was, fuck, Jordan is going to have sleep uh, trouble sleeping tonight. That's his girlfriend. Right, 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 right. right. Now, before I say anything, I'm an analyst, and if you were to ask Jordan, she would say I'm a skeptic and a very severe critical thinker, Mm -hmm. but I have had quite a few things happen in my life that I just can't explain away. In 2019, we lived in a house in the center of the peninsula. It always felt dark, both literally and figuratively. There was a large tree that had shaded our house. Mm -hmm. Jordan always felt off in this house. Our cat acted weird, mostly hiding out of sight or usually hiding inside the couch and staring at nothing. We had a problem with the dog getting fleas that would just not go away no matter how many treatments of the yard, dog, and house we completed. Mm -hmm. In October, we got the okay to leave the house in a not-so-common way. Jordan was working late that night, and I was home alone. I was getting ready to lie down for bed when some friends asked me to get online and play some games with them. We played for about 30 minutes when I heard what I thought was lightning. I thought it must have struck really close on account of it being so loud. But when I looked outside, there was no rain. However, the large tree that had shaded our house had somehow fallen on the house, pierced through the roof, and a large branch was stabbed through the ceiling right where I would have been lying in bed if I had gone to sleep. Oh, my God. I'll show you a picture at the end. Uh, We were relocated to a new house on the peninsula, and it's much brighter and feels better. We still feel that we see shadows just out of view, but none of it feels malicious here, and there are no fleas on our dog. Anyway, (laughs) thanks for all you do in providing mad entertainment for my deployments and our Uh, quiet nights at home. We love Scared to Death, and I just got Jordan to join the Legion of the Suck. (laughs) Creeper John and Peeper Jordan. P.S. Jordan has a wealth of crystals and wants more. Uh, P.P.S. If you come to Hawaii, do not take any rocks, coral, or shells. We didn't sleep well for two weeks until we returned them to where we got them. Something about lava gods. We apologized and slept amazingly that night. Ah, uh, thank you. So Joe, producer Joe's going to pop up a photo for us. Of, and thanks for your service, John. Look at that. Look at how that tree. Oh, my God. He said to ignore Jordan's pile of clothes that she never puts away. <laughs> Man. Is that, but did you see that, that big chunk yeah, in the left? Yeah, like, yeah. Oh my God, that would, yeah, that could take you out. Well, for sure. Jesus. For sure, Z. Right to the ceiling. Ay, ay, ay. Yikes. Then to wrap up uh, my portion of the show, yeah. I have a couple tiny shout outs. Okay. So I just want to give a big thank you and a shout out to Sam. Uh, he is a blacksmith. Oh, yeah, I saw you and he, with those. Yeah, I, I know I've been kind of like holding on to these. Uh, he forged these himself. And, you know, it'll be really hard to see on camera but they each have like a little symbol on them i don't know can you see that probably not and it sounds like a wind chime when they hit together i don't know if that's intentional or not but uh they're little talismans and we also got some necklaces from him too but these are for protection partnership growth and strength very cool man i've been tongue-tied today sorry guys also a little bit of an early birthday wish for our fan regina uh Regina, your brother-in-law, John, is so sweet. He sent a message asking if we could wish you a happy birthday. So happy birthday. I hope it's a spectacular day full of light and love and a little extra spoopiness. <laughs> and then we have a huge shout out to our fan, Roman Sacknow. Yeah. S- Sacknow. Sacknow, yeah. For this awesome fan compilation that uh, Joe's going to play for awesome. us. Awesome. You know, and, and let me, should I say my goodbyes and then we'll just end with Roman's? No, we're no, going to oh, do oh, Roman okay. and then we can okay. say goodbye. Perfect, perfect. You, you weren't paying attention to that meeting that we had before we shot this. <laughs> ah! Ah! Busted! So creepy. 
Mm-hmm. Oh. Hey, Dan. Hello, Lindsay. Hey. Um, <laughs> weirdly enough, this morning I woke up with a bloody mouth. What? Mm-hmm. So you need a bloody mouth. <laughs> yeah, you're telling me. So I sleep with night guards, right? Because oh, yeah. I grind my teeth. And this morning I had like a huge clump of blood come out of gross so gross out of the corner of my mouth and then they keep drinking so much water because i could taste blood in my mouth again uh so that what? mouth guard cut you or something i don't know it's smooth i checked it man is it a demon warning i don't know <laughs> i don't know do we have any stories about bloody mouth that's all i could think like after the <sighs> scary God. movie i was like oh of course now it's gonna get me did the light just flicker again i think so that was a really quick one okay Fun. Fun day for electrical problems. It's not an electrical problem. Whatever it is. See, this is this is the difference right here. This is mm -hmm. the difference. I immediately am like, yeah, I've always thought the studio was haunted. You are like, oh no, it's practical. It's just an electrical problem. But I, but I, I that's probably a defense mechanism because I could I could take that probably I would, I would probably take that so far that same line of thought like there could be things floating around the room and I'm like oh it's weird wind. <laughs> Oh, well, there's there's <laughs> wind in the room. It's a levitation wind came through there. <laughs> oh my day. God. I'm okay, but I'm uh, I, I'm I don't necessarily. Yeah, it's not that I think that you're making this stuff up. Yeah, I'm I just, not. Yeah, I know. I know. Uh, how d how dare you? <laughs> I just, Can I tell you something I haven't told you that what? you're going to make fun of? Sure. I am going to take an online healing crystal class. <laughs> oh God. Here we go. Mm -hmm. Me and my girlfriend Randy. Oh great. Yep. She signed us up for it. It's awesome. Because we need the crystals in our house to keep oh, the energy pure. Boy. Okay. It's good. I'm. I'm gonna. I'm, I. I will fucking. I will not live in a house of a bunch of crystals. You know. You know. That's like one of the main things I make fun of. Crystals and patchouli. Ah! Oh my god. Oh my god. Lock the doors. We're getting out of here. <laughs> my thought process is, and I think there's validity to this. There is not. There is not. I'm picturing you. I'm picturing a perfectly reasonable explanation. I'm picturing a neighbor coming over, knocking, something, you know, happened, or maybe something's gone on in the neighborhood. Maybe their dog got lost. Some, we, I mean, we know most of our neighbors. Our neighbors all have my phone number. Okay. They would call me at right. eight o'clock at night. It's dark out. It's creepy. Well, okay. But I'm still thinking, I'm still thinking a neighbor has come over. And what I'm worried about, just knowing you, is I'm worried that if you don't at least see who came to the door, then you're going to get all worked up in your, and to be totally selfish, then I'm not going to get good sleep because I'm going to have to be calming you down forever and you're going to, you know, for the next several nights because you're going to be convinced that some monster was at the door. Are you out of your fucking mind? Are you yeah, fucking very crazy? Angry. Fuck you. Don't you remember the fucking Black Eyed Children? <laughs> Who's there? Oh my God, why would you do that? You don't talk to it. You don't engage. That's I the number one rule. Don't be afraid. Come with me. Oh, fuck my life. Do you want to play hide and seek? No! <laughs> I will show you where I play hide and seek. Oh, no, you're not. Don't let him in. Don't let him in. I'm not doing this. Stop! Stop! Help! You're going to die in there. We live here now. We have to try and live together. We're really scared of you. Please, just leave us. Don't say I didn't warn you. Get out! Out! Get out! <laughs> you leave! You leave! You leave! Was that you crying at the end? That was creepy. It's you typing. So creepy. Mm hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 Roman. But also awesome. That was good, uh, chill inducing. I sound like a lunatic. Mm hmm. I love with the sound bite, it's just compiling a new little narrative. <laughs> well done. Well done. Bravo. Thank you, Roman. Thank Ro you, Roman. <laughs> Roman is qu quite the audio wizard. Uh, he's done some cool things on Time Suck, too. Like oh, on, on yeah. the Secret Suck, he's sending some comp. I'm like, man, he's getting better and better. <laughs> uh, well, that's all for today. Thanks for continuing to send in your personal tales of terror to my story at scared to death podcast.com. Thanks again, Roman, for that compilation. That was very cool that you put together. Uh, you can email us for everything else at info at scared to death podcast.com. 
Thanks to Logan and Kate uh, on social media uh, and badmagicmerch.com for the merch design. Producer Sophie Evans for help with story curation. Joe Paisley and Zach Flannery for producing, directing, adding, and creating the custom sound beds. Heather Rylander for organizing the My Story emails. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram if you want even more content. At Scared to Death Podcast. Subscribe to Bad Magic Productions on YouTube. Thanks for the reviews and ratings you leave er- anywhere. So helpful. There's been a lot of them lately. They've been very positive. They, they, I definitely check them out and, and appreciate them. And look at the feedback that's critical as well. And, you know, and if it's valid, make adjustments. Mm-hmm. And just, yeah, thank you very much, all of you creeps and peepers. Enjoy your nightmares. Hope you were scared to death. If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through but has no home here within scared to death.